the short answer is just like with anything else, you, you almost have to put in the time and the reps to become to become good at it, right? I mean, there's always a learning curve to just about anything. Sometimes you'll still get some oddities in the photos, like maybe you get six fingers or like a third arm growing somewhere. But like even that has diminished so, you know, so much. Quickly came up with this idea for campfire, you know? It's like, oh, that's cool. It sounds intimate, small, like all those things. And started developing the landing page for this event. And that's where I think, you know, that mid-journey components, like no one else has that image. Right, this is unique to us. I can infuse it with our brand color. Hi everyone, and welcome to the AI Marketing Show. My name is Isabel Vedoya, and today we have a special guest who's going to talk to us all about AI for image generation. So before we get started, if you could please help me welcome Drew Brooker into this call. I'm, hey, Drew, I'm, waiting, I'm, I'm waiting for you to clap, Isabella. <laughs> I'm going to clap. <laughs> Drew, you get all the I'm claps. Because I'm actually really excited about this because I don't do a lot of um, AI images. So I'm actually like super excited to chat with you about this. Heck today. yeah. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, this will be fun. Cool, cool. Well, thanks for joining. Um, so if you guys don't know Drew, he is a marketing executive and he's an AI consultant. He specializes in image generation, specifically with MidJourney. And you might have seen him on LinkedIn. And if you have, I'm sure you're blown away. I'm blown away by all the images that he's always posting. That's all AI generated. Um, so, Drew, before we we kick into like talking about AI and stuff, like, why don't you share with us a little bit about like your background, like what led you to actually, you know, where you are now, and then what uh, prompted you to go into AI? Yeah. So I think you know, first of all, I think this is relevant right? For, for all marketers or, or even sellers listening, you know, my background is primarily in sales and marketing. I started the first half of my career in sales specifically, transitioned over to marketing probably about seven or eight years ago now. And that was really where I sort of found my, my passionate space. And so I've primarily worked in B2B tech companies, SaaS companies, startups, you know, hyper growth sort of environments and sort of the idea of always doing you know, a little bit of everything, right? Like, you know, as a marketer, I think it's a, it's a very big space. Things are always changing all the time, you know, and that interests me quite a bit. I have a, a real knack for curiosity and learning. And so it's right up my alley, right. To, to kind of do a little bit of everything. And then just by nature, I'm a creative person. I love to uh, do anything from like photography to graphic design and that's why I think this is a great conversation because, you know, for those creative marketers out there, there are so many possibilities coming down the pipeline, specifically as it relates to AI, as you know. And so I'm hoping to shine a little bit of light on that today. That's amazing. And and yeah, I'm sure, you know, if, if you've ever worked in marketing, I'm sure we've all felt that uh, wearing all the hats at some point. <laughs> all of us. All of us. <laughs> yep. <laughs> totally relate. So when... When you started like diving deeper into like mid journey and into like um, image generations and stuff like that, how how did you start? Like, did you just start trying a bunch of tools and just putting in random things, or did you just kind of start getting better by by prompting it? It's a great question. You know, the sh the short answer is just like with anything else, you, you almost have to put in the time and the reps to become to become good at it, right? I mean, there's always a learning curve to just about anything. How big is that curve? Is is really the the variable there. But for me personally, um, I think where I became very interested in it is Midjourney has developed a lot, you know, since it it launched, right? So in in sort of its V1, as it's called, the February of 2022, it was very hard to create anything that resembled anything that you actually wanted, right? And then its quality got better over time. And in this 16 month period between V1 and V5.2, the quality just escalated so quickly and so much that it, be, it took this shift from becoming a fun thing and solely just kind of playing around with it to, holy cow, like this actually has some utility in my business, right? Like in my day-to-day -day job, I could use this. And so, you know, I jumped in. I think January of this year, it was at like V4, you know, it was good, but it wasn't great. Right. So as a photographer, it, 
really scratched this nice itch for me because when I had kids, like time to edit photos or go out to a location or show up at a location at the right time because photography is all about light. Like those kind of things didn't really, they weren't as available to me, right? I didn't have two hours to spend editing a photo to perfection like I like to do. You know, that was very much like an artistic hobby of mine. And so what Mid Journey did was provide this middle ground between almost like photography and graphic design where I could play around. I didn't have to show up at a location. I didn't need my camera. I didn't need perfect weather conditions. I didn't need a model, you know, to shoot or um, to, to have the right sort of camera lens for something. I could just create. And there's never going to be a, a full-time replacement for photography in that sense. But to understand how this now has some utility in the workspace fascinated me. And so I wanted to put that to the test and I'm sure we'll go into it, but like, where could I use this? Right. And would it save me time? Would it save me money? And I quickly realized that it would do that and more. And so it only made sense to dive into it further. Wow. And and that's actually like the next question that I had for you is when you did start exploring and when you did start, you know, playing around with with um, and in this case, mid journey did where did you how did you figure out what use cases for the images? You know, because I'm pretty sure uh, logos, it can't really do logos that well. Right. Yeah. So, like, that's a great point. Right. Like th there are still some limitations that exist with something like mid journey. And, and just to be clear for the listeners too, like mid journey is not the only text to image tool out there. The reason I chose it is it seemed to have the best quality. And um, I don't know, I think I just sort of have this knack for identifying the, the right tool I want to associate with, because the last thing you want to do, right, is go almost too far with one tool. And then maybe if that one disappears, right, you've got to, <laughs> you've got to relearn another one. So I did choose that wisely. It seemed to have the best quality. Um, there was some real traction behind it. In terms of like, yeah, the limitations that it has, you're right. Like sometimes with things like letters, uh, specifically or words, they're very hard to create anything consistently. It, but, you know, that multi, what's called like sort of that multimodal uh, sort of performance with something like Mid Journey is only going to improve with time, right? It's just a matter of time bef before that does become applicable and usable, just like the quality we just talked about. So I think that will get solved. You know, sometimes you'll still get some oddities in the photos, like maybe you get six fingers or like a third arm growing somewhere. But like even that has diminished so, you know, so much, right? So, I mean, yeah, you may get it from time to time, but the consistency has been amazing. So having said all that, right, like use cases, where, where did I sort of uh, decide this? I guess the first thing that came to mind was we had a customer event coming up at, uh, at the company I was, I was at. And so I was thinking, okay, I was already using AI, like, you know, chat GPT, for example, to think through, hey, what's like a cool name for this event? that associates with our brand, right? So our brand was associated with like cowboy culture, Wild West, you know, the company's name was Lasso. So like, what can we call this, right? And as you know, like AI is fantastic for brainstorming. Quickly came up with this idea for campfire, you know? It's like, oh, that's cool. It sounds intimate, small, like all those things. And started developing the landing page for this event, you know, and, and started to, you know, really utilize AI for that. And then I thought, yeah, now we kind of need like an image, you know, to associate with this event, right? And I'd already kind of been playing with some ideas behind Lasso and if I could kind of get the technology to work with me there and ultimately landed on a great image, right, to use. And and actually, um, I don't know if this will work. Let me see if I can share my screen here real quick. I'll show you an exact example. Okay. So with that example, right, let me just, this is the exact page, right? So campfire, let's sort of describe this event. Everything that's highlighted or underlined in this purple is generated by AI, right? Like, so, so the whole thing and proving this out in real, you know, like a real use case was an aha moment for me, you know? So mm -hmm. again, going back to that brainstorming component of something like chat GPT, instead of like save your seat for this event, how about save your saddle, right? Like maybe it would have taken me like 15 minutes to come up with, I'm just staring at a wall, but 
you know, using AI I can get like 50 ideas in a second and say, oh, that's the one, right? And then same with this image, right? This is something that I developed in mid-journey. I'm like, how could I incorporate something? You know, I did added some little illustrative elements here on my own, but like this image itself, straight out of mid-journey. And ultimately what we did was have a customer only event where we presented slides, all of those slides had images that were generated, you know, by Midjourney with the brand, right? Like, so here are some examples of images that I created in Midjourney for our brand. They incorporate brand colors, black, yellow. They have the environment, the mood, the scene, um, all of those specific elements to the brand that are not stock photography, right? Um, they have sort of this element to them that make them very, very unique. And so, you know, proving out that sort of use case, I guess, in real time was a real aha moment for me, you know, because it's like, okay, well, if I can do this, then what else can I do? And so that's where it's like, you could think about blog images, you know, social media posts, ad creative, thumbnails for all of your videos, um, presentations, slides, merchandise. So at that same customer event, we gave away like coasters, candles that had like a smoky smell to them, like campfire. But the imagery we created for those candles, mid journey, the slide mm -hmm. presentations, mid journey, the swag that we gave out, mid journey imagery. So all that stuff proved out. And then it, again, like I just said, you really thought through all the potential use cases and it's like, okay, we've got new website pages coming up, right? Like what's not, let's infuse this with brand generated images that are not stock and we don't have to hire a photographer for. And so it just snowballed from there. Wow. That's really amazing. And, you know, I just have like two questions about that. The first one is when you showed me that whole landing page, um, just out of curiosity, I don't know if you know this, but like how long did it take you to put together all of that? Like the website, the landing page, the images, the copy. Great question. Hmm. You know, it's hard to say specifically. I, I would just say probably like an hour or two. You know, what and I mean? like, if you wouldn't have used AI, like how long yeah. do you think it would have taken you? Yeah, I think that's where it's like uh, that's where you start to realize the the element of savings, right? So, yeah, you know, maybe I've got a copywriter on my team. Maybe I don't. Um, how long does it take them to come up with that stuff? Do I need to communicate this? So, like, I think it can really empower people individually, but also as a team. And, you know, I just so happened to be sort of operating our website. I was sort of like the main uh, executor of anything that we did visually through the website. Um, and so this was almost like a personal project. And, and to your point, like how long did it take me? Probably like an hour or two, right? How long would it would have taken me? I don't know. How would have, how long would it have taken to come up with a cool name and, um, you know, have some sort of image to fit the vibe of that, right? Because let's face it, a lot of companies out there, a lot of a lot of B2B companies out there, there's not really specific good stock photography that you know relates to your industry. And if it does, there's chances are like you could go a couple websites and see the same exact image. Yeah. But what's unique to you? And that's where I think, you know, that mid-journey components like no one else has that image, right? This is unique to us. I can infuse it with our brand color our items or our aesthetics or personality and right it's just a whole different experience in general yeah and that's i mean that's so powerful because now you're able to to hyper personalize your marketing and all your assets the the second question that i had around that like and i know this comes up all the time but it's it's around like copywriting right like yeah anything that's um ai generated you, do you know much about that? If it's AI generated, who belongs to or how to navigate yeah. those waters? Yeah, I'm happy to jump into that. I think there, for, first of all, I'll just say this, there's still some unknowns and gray areas within that. But where I can really provide some guidance is through what's already taken place. So if you are a mid-journey user, a paid user, which now is everybody because they used to offer a free trial. Now you've got to be a paid user. It starts really cheaply, 10 bucks a month. If you're listening to this and you're a marketer, this could be a tool that is in your marketing budget, for example. Uh, then you own, you own that individual, you own rights to that specific image. Now, let's take a step back. How did Midjourney become so great at creating good images, right? Well, 
similar to Google in a sense, right? Like they scraped, they scraped the entire web. Um, I don't know what limitations were on that, but I do know that some of those images did have copyrights on them, right? So it's important to note that because I guess at the end of the day, what it comes down to is in order to train a model like that, you need to train it on as many things or, you know, your direction of that. Because they made that choice, right? Like they put themselves sort of in this gray area of, hey, look, like, could we potentially be liable for this? And I'm speaking from Midjourney's behalf. Could we potentially be uh, under fire for this eventually? And that's the great debate right now, right? Can copyrighted images be used to, to teach or learn uh, you know, for data learning for a machine. And the reality is with Midjourney, you can create styles of a particular artist or this or that and the other, and you can do it in two ways. You can use their exact name, right? Like, so let's just use like Christopher Nolan as an example. Let's just say I want to create images that have a cinematic flair to them. And, um, you know, they look like Nolan's movies, right? Like, like Batman or Oppenheimer. Um, you can prompt using keywords like his name, but you can also prompt without including him and describe it in a different way. And I think if you want to be very careful about something that you're using for financial gain or commercially, exclude specific names, right? Because at the end of the day, that sort of bulletproofs you for the sense that I have a feeling if anything happens, Midjourney is going to be on the hook. But if they really, really wanted to dig into individual prompts and understand, hey, look, like so and so made money off of this, we can actually go and look at the exact prompt. This sort of safeguards you from that. So that's sort of my advice. Now, I am not legal counsel or anything like that. So if you if you have like really deep questions about it, it's probably best to go that route. I will say that in the people that I've talked to, there's just not a lot of precedence there because it's not a one for one comparison to say something like Napster where it's the exact song, right? It's a one for one. Even Google, right? Scraping the web. It's like, well, those aren't images though, right? Like it's, it's mm -hmm. just information and who owns information? Is there an artistic element? Does someone, hum you know, does human own that information? So it's just slightly different. There's no real precedence for this. As a country, Japan's kind of come out and made the first move in a sense of saying, hey, look, like we don't see any problem in using this in this way, because at the end of the day, you need a human element to make something unique. So hopefully that context sort of provides some picture, some clarity for you. But the truth is that there's still just so many things that have to play out. But you could absolutely start to put this into use cases for all those things I ha I just mentioned, without worry, uh, especially if you're you know eliminating the need for like identifying specific artists or directors or you know brands, for example. Yeah, I, similar with uh, ChatGPT, I was just reading that you know it's like it's been under fire because like authors are claiming copyright on. Okay. So that's work. interesting. Yeah. You know, and it's, and it's really interesting because like I was reading an article yesterday that part of the lawsuit is that you can't really, there the use case is not for financial gain is to train the LLM. So because of that, then um, the copyright doesn't necessarily protect for the way the words were written as a framework. And, and I think that's what makes it like kind of gray area. <laughs> yes. So that's really right, interesting. Because you can create something or even, even in the word context, you can, you can have something sound like somebody, but at the end of the day, it's not something that they created. You've trained it using their skill set, but it's not like you're, you've taken a painting of theirs and then you're selling it, right? Like right. it's not a one for one. So yeah, it, it is a little bit interesting to kind of see how things are going to play out with that. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, when it comes to like, like image AI, is it similar to like chat GBT where there's also like privacy issues in terms of like, you know, with chat GBT, a lot of the times it's like, don't put your personal information, don't share your IP. Are there ways to kind of, um, are there like that, that kind of, is that that sort of risk with Midjourney? That's a interesting question. I've actually not I've been talking about this a lot. I have not heard that question before. To my knowledge, I've not run into that as being a concern in any way. 
Um, I think it just comes down to the type of information you're feeding it, right? Like, so, so maybe there could be, but with the text to image generation, I'm not sure I can identify like a, a use case where you'd actually want to put in anything that, you know, is potentially not friendly to share anyway, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So I know we talked a lot about um, MidJourney, but are there any other AI tools that people should check out or? Oh, you're going to, you're going to ask me, I should be asking you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, like, and feel free to jump in on this because I think you and I could riff on this a bit, but like, I know you're a big fan of perplexity. You drilled that into my head when we first met and I love that, you know, like I had heard of it, but I wasn't really using it. And then when, when you and I spoke, uh, when we met initially, right, I started really playing around with that. I think that's an extremely powerful tool. I, I'm really liking kind of this ability to toggle back and forth between something like ChatGPT and Claude. You know, I, yeah. I do think Claude has some interesting pros to it that ChatGPT can't quite offer and vice versa. You know, they're, they're, they're two different models that are excel at different things, you know, and Claude too, to me is just a little bit better with some things around copy and content in some ways. And so that's a, that's an interesting thing that I've been playing around with. I, I really like these tools too, that, um, we're able to really repurpose content very quickly as well from an AI perspective, you know, as a marketer, you know, if you're listening to this, right? Like content is an amazing thing, but we're all trying to go after the same thing. How do we create as much high quality content with as much quantity as possible, right? Because you almost want to, you have all these things that you want to talk about, whether it be at dis different stages of where the buyer's at or that align to your brand or whatever the case is, but you also want to make sure that they're good. And so much time can be eaten up. And so it's interesting, like if you've uploaded a podcast and it can break it down into all these short clips for you or start to identify particular, you know, real good moments or juicy moments of the podcast that maybe stick out. And I think, again, it's only going to get better with time. It can provide key takeaways from the podcast. It can provide sort of even a, a really jumping off point for a blog, right? It'll spit out a blog. Is it ready to go for prime time? I don't know. But it's probably at least 80% of the way there. So I think just those kind of components are super interesting to me as a marketer, because in these small environments, in these like where you're working with like three or four other people on your team and you're moving quick, time is so important. And to be able to have that going and utilize tools like that has been extremely powerful for me. Trying to think if there's anything else that like really stands out. What do you got on top of your mind right now? Well, I was going to ask you if if uh, if you've played around with uh, Runway or Stable Diffusion. I have not played around with Stable Diffusion. I know what it is. Uh, have played around with Runway a little bit. I know what it is. I should have. I should probably be spending a little bit more time than I am. I think one thing that's still getting to me is it's just not quite to the point where I feel absolutely compelled to dive in. Although that should not be uh, the reason why I haven't. I, I think it's just a reality of how much time do I have? I've decided to really just go deeper into mid journey, but that runway is so exciting. Runway is going to be a game changer, right? Like you could literally get to this point. And for those of you that don't know what runway is, it is essentially text or image to video generation. And people in the next year or two are going to be producing movies, high quality movies from their home, right? Through characters they may have developed in mid journey and have all these ideas in these heads. So it's, it's democratized and freed up all of this use to create, you know, and to do it with video is just, it's mind boggling to think about. Uh, people are taking mid journey images right now, right? And putting them into, to runway and what it, you know, its current capabilities are is, I think it's like somewhere between four to 18 seconds of movement. Some of it's very choppy, some of it isn't. So sometimes depends on the type of image you have. That's why I'm not fully in it yet, but it's, it's man, it's coming and it's exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting. I haven't played around with either, but I have seen a couple of 
of videos that just went viral on LinkedIn and it was like yeah. trailers and like yeah. very cinematic, like yep. <laughs> super cool. I think one of them is called Emily. I think there's a movie coming soon. Um, but yeah, that's, that's going to be a whole new world. Um, AI generated movies. So, and, and also speaking on that, you know, it's really interesting cause I saw it makes you wonder with like Hollywood and celebrities, um, their AI clones. I think, yeah. Messi had a campaign with uh I can't remember I think it was Synthesia where they were doing like they, they cloned him and they oh, did wow. a thing for Lays and he was sending personalized it was like an AI clone of him sending out personalized messages to whoever uh participated. It was for the, the Lays chips. And it was really Pretty cool, wild. right? Because everybody's talking about Messi. <laughs> Pretty wild. Yeah, so that's interesting. That's a whole for on the creator perspective, that's also another um monetization route that we haven't even really thought about absolutely um, well you know what else is that remember that drake video that or the drake song that that guy produced basically using yeah. i can't remember what the software whether it was 11 labs or something but you know was able to recreate a song or or create a song with drake's voice and it sound like you would not have known the difference will these artists sell you know with certain limitations right like I'm not going to talk about this or whatever the standards are, but essentially sell that piece off. So you could have people like me and you say, Hey, I'm a, I love to produce music. And now I have the right to take Drake's voice. If I use it in this way and maybe even like make a splash as some sort of producer or in Drake makes a cut off of everything that, you know, like there could be royalties that come in it, but it's just, it's fascinating. I think the, the possibilities are, are endless. Absolutely. Yeah, we're all traveling new waters. Um, and it's really exciting because it's not just a portion of us. It's like society as a whole. Yeah. What makes it even more exciting. <laughs> yeah, it does. So let me ask you a question. Um, would you be willing to share a prompt or like a live demo of how to generate something on MidJourney? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So let me do this. I'm going to share my screen here. So um, for those of you that aren't familiar or maybe have been in here once or twice, right? Like there's, there's a current process with mid journey where when you sign up um, mid journey doesn't currently have its own UI interface. So it goes through discord, which you've probably at least heard of, but it doesn't make it the, it's not the friendliest thing to jump into for a lot of people. Right. So there's a bit of a learning curve there that exists. But essentially what you do, right, is you're going to get to a place once you're once you're signed up with MidJourney and in Discord where you can go down to this bar at the bottom. And let me just take this out for a second. And you're going to be left with this, right? And so this is where you would input a prompt, just like you would with ChatGPT. Now, with any image that you create in MidJourney through Discord, you need to type backslash imagine. And that's the beginning of this piece right here where it pops up as a prompt. So anything that you type in after this is going to is going to go into your prompt. So for the for this particular example, I just came up with something very quickly so I wasn't put on this too too on the spot with this. But the thing you need to know about Midjourney too is this is image generation that spans all mediums, all styles, right? So while some of us may care specifically about photorealism, you could also care about, like you could create icons in here, illustrations in here, uh, cartoons in here. Uh, you could do sketches, like any type of style artistically that has a visual element to it, you could create in here. And so that's why I think, you know, these prompts, people get very overwhelmed at first because they, don't, they, they start out with an empty screen, just like we just did. And there are several ways to offset that. We can maybe get into that in a second, but just for the example of this, right? Like, let's see what happens when I put this in, right? So I want a photograph of a woman with freckles in the style of photorealistic details, yada, yada, yada. These are all things that I've played around with. Like, for example, this name right here is a particular artist, like a photographer. So this is going to sort of take a little bit of the trained element of what they know this person's kind of photos look like, whether that's like from a tone perspective or the coloring of it, or um, maybe the kind of like editing they have. Is it like smooth skin? Is it raw skin, it, et cetera, right? So I've got the prompt in here. And then at the back end of all your prompts, 
you have the option to put in what's called something like a parameter. So a parameter always starts with a dash dash, and then it's got sort of a, let's just call it a code attached to it. This one is particularly AR, which stands for aspect ratio. Now, if you've ever gone through stock photography, you know one of the challenges is, hey, this is either a horizontal image or it's a landscape. Or I mean, it's a landscape or a vertical image, I'm sorry. And you only have two choices. Now, if you've played around with Canva, for example, you know that like different platforms like different dimensions. And this allow AR specifically allows you to craft whatever dimension you want with this image, right? So four or five is going to give me something that's vertical, like an Instagram feed image. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead. Once I've, once I've entered this, I can hit enter and then it's going to send this to the mid journey bot. Okay. And so what's going to happen is it's going to take that information. It's going to sit with it for a minute and come back with the results. Uh, so for the sake of this example, uh, you've got, I'll show you one other thing here. I'm going to go into the settings and don't worry about if you don't know this, we can talk to this later, but there are two different modes, right? Well, three now, but relax mode is sort of like the slowest. And the way that these sort of work is, you know, they take up GPU or memory. And so I don't want to necessarily, I'm not in a rush to get this image, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I've just got it in relax mode and that's my current setting. Now you can start to see right here where my mouse is at that it's starting to generate these images. This has sort of a progress bar of where the image generation is at, right? And so it's starting to develop these things. You can see this progress in real time. Okay, 46%. And well, once we once we get this image, uh, I'll show you kind of the different options that we have available to us. There's going to be some things here that maybe won't make sense initially if you haven't played around with this, but uh, I'll just kind of dive into that for you as well. Wow, this is amazing. And just a, a question, when you came up with the prompt, like, you know, it's like one with freckles and the style of, you know, X, Y, and Z and all those like little things, did you learn did you already know that because you know like photography and like graphic design or is this something that you learned um because of mid journey it's a great question both uh, there there are some ways that i i you know depending on how we want to take this conversation i can show some some really good examples of how to maybe educate yourself on that really quickly um but both right because i'm i'm going for photorealism i've started to realize that certain words are going to give me that right because if i just put a woman with freckles um, and some other words that don't necessarily mean anything in terms of photorealism, it might give me a totally different style of that, right? And we could we could show that as an example. But so here it gives me four images. And this is what you get anytime you put a prompt in. It's going to give you a square of four. Now, depending on the size screen you're working with, right? Maybe you want to analyze this a little bit closer so you can click into this and it's gonna it's gonna enlarge this a little bit, a little bit more. One other option you have, right? If that's still not big enough, is I can click open in browser. And this is gonna this is gonna give me it even bigger. I can zoom in, right? I can zoom back out. Um, but the point being, right, like you can get very detailed with with what you're looking for. And right, like these are high quality outputs um, to the point where this looks like something I could have, you know, taken a model that looks like this, shot it somewhere, edited it you know, spent hours doing all of that and gotten something very similar to this. That's that's the kind of quality we're dealing with. And so it's really impressive. From here, you have the chance to do a couple different things, right? This is, so there are these numbers associated, one, two, three, and four. This is sort of one of the learning curve moments, right? Is this, this means one, this is two, this is three, this is four, right? One, two, three, four. So left to right, left to right. Now there are two options here, U and V. U means, hey, I want to what's called upscale this image. I want to create a larger high res, you know, high res, res, high res option for that particular image. So I would choose this if I really like one of these four images. And for this case, we'll go ahead and choose one. I really like, I really like number two uh, because of the sharpness. Uh, with her eyes and there's a really good contrast drop off here. So like I'm going to click U2. So that means I'm going to upscale that. And as you can see here, right, 
it's taking that instruction and it's gonna generate that. Now, while that's loading, let me just kind of show you the other options that you have here. V stands for very. So very would be, hey, there are certain elements to this that I kind of like, but this, Im this image isn't quite it. Um, or I wanna see like maybe like a, a one-off kind of version of this. So like I can click V2 on that same image and it's gonna generate me four new images now based off of this, right, versus this. And so this will be the new starting point for that. And we're gonna get to quickly see kind of what that looks like, all right? And then the last option that you have on this square of four is this re-roll, re you know, like sort of this refresh button. And basically all this means is, hey, if I want to run this prompt again, right? Because either I really liked it or I didn't like any of these. I just want to see like another four. I can click this. And what it's going to do is generate four new images for me using the same prompt. Still with me? Yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> All right, cool. Yeah. And and so I, this is going to be different for everyone, right? Because maybe some of you have already played around with this, but this is really the 101 of what you're doing in here. And let's go back to the image that I upscaled, right? Here's that image. It's a larger version image now. It sits by itself. I even have a couple more options with this, right? So what do I want to do with this? So very strong means kind of exactly what this is, right? It's going to create an iteration based off this that is taking certain parts of that image and creating new, new images. So maybe she's got different color eyes. Maybe she looks a little bit different. Maybe she's um, got a different pose, right? So I usually describe this as having like probably three or four different elements on the original. And then you've got something what's called like a very subtle, which is just that, right? It's like a subtle change to this. So maybe she's got, um, you know, different eyebrows. Maybe she's got different eyes, but it's, it's a very close relation to it uh, of this image. These other options are super interesting too, right? Because if I want to, I don't know, say want to zoom out, right? Which, which is called out painting. I can click this. And basically what it's going to do is generate this image. And almost if you've played around with Photoshop or heard the term generative fill, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to back up, right? It's going to back up from this photo and it's going to paint around it what it thinks, right? The surrounding element should be, which is also fascinating, right? And then let's just say, you know, for these other options, there's one called custom zoom. Remember when we were talking about this AR and, you know, this certain sort of uh, dimension? Yep. Well, you can change this on the fly too, right? Like, let's say I want to create this in a different dimension. Let's say I want to create this landscape instead, which is like a 16.9. And you can, you know, again, you can kind of use, utilize that same zoom function, but I don't want to zoom out. So I'm going to keep this at one and I'm going to hit submit. And now what it's going to do is create a new res solution on that. Okay. So stay with me here. We're almost, we're almost done, but I just want to showcase the different options here. So now going back to this square, this is indicating that this was that variation strong one that we did. So if you don't recall that, that was when I hit V2 on this image that I liked, right? And remember how I said it's going to be kind of like a cousin to this, right? Like there's going to be some elements are the same. Mm -hmm. Well, you see the blue eyes, you see the red hair, you see the freckles, right? you see kind of the same color as well, but these are four different faces. You know what I mean? Different eyebrows, different lips, different noses, different freckle placement, et cetera, different shadows, right? So there's some close relation to that. Now you, you have the same option, right? And this is where the endless possibilities come into play. You have all these same options as before, because like, let's just say I wanted to upscale one of these. I really liked image number two again. I could click upscale. And then once that's done, I've got all the same options I had here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that's really fascinating as well. I'm going to click one other component of this as well, which is what's called a pan feature. And that's where these arrows come into play. So let's just say I want to build out what's left, what's to the left of her. Let's, let's have mid journey. Imagine what's to the left of her. Now clicking this button, button, it's going to do that. If I wanted what's right of her, it would do that, et cetera, et cetera, right? So let's 
Let's scroll down just a little bit further. And this when you was, click the pen, um, when you click the pen, do you do you have an opportunity to prompt it what you wanted to show or no? Uh, that's a great question. With the pan, no. With something like um, the Vary and Zoom Out and Custom Zoom, you do. There's a mm -hmm. setting in here what's called uh, Remix. I don't use it a whole lot. Some people do. But essentially what this will do is, let's say I want to vary this strong. It brings this up every time, right? So I can okay. change certain components of the prompt. But what I found is I like to go about it just in a different way. I feel like I would rather change the word because sometimes it will take one word or two words and it kind of just, it's hit or miss on whether it's actually helpful or not. I find mm -hmm. it faster to not use it, but that's, that's a personal preference. Gotcha. Right? That's really interesting. So you kind of see like these, these options are really endless. And so let's go back to those other outputs we got. Okay, just really quickly. This was when we re-rolled it, right? So when we said, hey, look, we want four new images using the same prompt. This is what it gave me, right? And so you're back at square one. Do I want to upscale? Do I want to vary? Do I want four new images, et cetera? This was the variation subtle, right? So closer to the original image, right? They all kind of have a similar face. It's not quite the same person, but it's dang close, right? Yeah. So I like to describe the very subtle as like maybe one to three elements that have changed. This was the zoom out, right? So if we back up two times, right? Here's what it's painting the image for me, right? So it's creating some of that background a little bit, what she's wearing a little bit. You see how these, these clothes are very different. What's in the background is very different. And then again, right? You're back at square one. You have all these options. Do I want four new takes on that because I don't like any of these? Do I like one and want to upscale it, et cetera, et cetera? This was the custom zoom, right? So we said, hey, we wanted a landscape aspect ratio. So we wanted like something that was a little bit more long horizontally. And again, recreated that. It didn't zoom out, but it did create you know, different backgrounds. And again, you can see even different sort of material of the clothing, different, different mm -hmm. items yeah. there. And then lastly, you know, when we did the pan left, for examples, right? So just moved over slightly and painted in what would be to the left of her. And I didn't zoom out on that either, right? So it created that same sort of closeness to her face, but just painted in what's to the left. And again, back at square one, you could do whatever you wanted with this. And so that's just a, I know that was a little bit long, but that's, that is the full sort of, um, I would say basic understanding of all the different directions you can take this just with the image prompts, right? Let alone all of the, you know, parameters that could come into play. And we haven't even talked about those. And I don't even know if if we want to have time going into those, but. <laughs> wow, that is absolutely incredible. And, you know, that kind of goes back to everything that you were saying, that there's so many use cases and like, you know, right now we just put a, a woman, you know, a woman with freckles and it created these like hyper-realistic images. And, you know, it's, these are things that you can put on your website. These are things that you can, you know, make them actually personalized to you and your brand. So that was really powerful. Um, Thank you for, for walking us through that whole experience. Yeah, and I'll just say one other thing on that. You know this better than anybody, but as you spend more and more time in there, that empty box where you prompt becomes less and less, uh, you, you become less and less intimidated by that, right? Because a lot of people's expectations are that you're going to get something perfect right out of the box with AI. And it's just not the reality in a lot of cases, right? Like you and I know that even it, everything, almost everything requires iteration, unless you've just built out this, this, this great mega prompt that you know has worked, you're going to have to iterate on it. And it's the same case with this, right? You're not going to know what photograph of a woman with freckles is going to get you um, without clarifying anything about photorealism and expect realism and you don't get it until you do it. Right. And right. so there's, there are places within mid journey and discord where you can see other people's prompts too. And that's an extremely powerful way to kind of learn at scale.
because you're not just counting on your own imagination or creativity right out of the gate, which is an obvious hurdle to start. That's amazing. That's a really good, um, that's really good insight. So when it comes to like, you know, we just learned, we all just learned how to use mid journey. Um, when it comes down to like, for example, telling a business, you know, whether like head of marketing or whatever it is, what do you think are like best practices for them to onboard tools like mid journey into their, their team and their workflow? Something I'm thinking a lot about right now, because like I just mentioned, there is an obvious hurdle there and it kind of comes down to what's going to happen in the future with AI upskilling. You know, some of these companies, whether they know it or not, actually have access to funds and budget relative to AI upskilling. Yeah. You know, so, so I think at a company level, at the very least, that's look that's look worth looking into to see if that's something that you qualify for. But with with Midjourney, right, you almost need somebody to either learn this on their own time, um, get trained on it or outsource, you know, like it, it's gotta be one of the three to do it effectively. And it is, and it's, it's absolutely worth doing one of those three. And I'll tell you why, right? Like we've already talked about stock photography. It is painful, you know, especially if you've been on the side of like trying to create assets for your company with imagery involved, website imagery involved, blog imagery, right? Like you're at the mercy of what's there. And it has no identity and you may have seen it before, right? So like all those things come into play. And then the other end of that spectrum is hiring a professional photographer. And as much as it hurts me to say as just like a photographer, that's not practical for a lot of us, right? Like you've got to find a photographer. You've got to find a particular style. You've got to set their location. Do you need to travel them? Um, what kind of shots do you want, right? Like you got to create a creative brief. You need to maybe, you know, wait for the delivery of these things. And so all of those things kind of come into play. And it's like, yeah, there's room for this middle ground where you can create unique imagery on your own in real time and test and play. So long way of saying it need, if you're a marketer or a marketing leader, you need to think of one of three things with something like mid journey. And it doesn't matter if it's mid journey or any other image generation platform for that matter. But do I have somebody that can spend the time with it to learn it? Because it does require repetition and experimentation. Do I want to bring in somebody that can train and upscale my team, which is one of the areas that I'm specifically focused in? Or do I just wanna like get the work done and outsource it to somebody that knows what they're doing? So one of the things that I didn't show you um, on this though, was I created out an entire branded library for my previous company, right? So I knew, hey, we want this kind of lighting, this kind of mood, this is our demographic. Um, this is the kind of like clothes that they wear. This is the kind of like facial expressions I want. Possibilities are are endless, right? But took me maybe two hours to create a, you know, a library of what, 100 to 200 images just because I know how to prompt in mid journey and I know what I'm looking for. I mean, you think about how you can take this library and then apply it to everything visual that you do. It's a no brainer. And so, yeah, you, you have to be thinking about one of these three things. I was thinking about this before we, we hopped on, but you remember when Canva first came out and it was like maybe one person on your team knew how to use it effectively. Yeah. And now it's it's so <laughs> democratized among you know teams in general because it, Canva's really made it easy. Where Midjourney's at right now is there's just there's some obstacles that exist, right? The prompting, the Discord, um, you know, the experimentation, the time. And so as a marketer, you need to make a decision which one of these three buckets do I want in, you know, go down? Is it the time and myself or somebody on my team? Is it, you know, training, you know, bringing somebody in to coach and train my team or is it outsourcing the project entirely? Absolutely. Those are the, I agree with you. Those are like really good, um, three really good ways to, to start integrating. And I'm sure that now that you mentioned all of that, I'm sure that some people might be fearful about their, their jobs. So just to put some <laughs> fears at ease, what do you think about photographers and graphic designers? Do you think they're going to go extinct or... Uh, is this the push that they should 
that they need to upskill into AI so they don't become extinct. Yeah, it's not all doom and gloom. I, I don't think that they're going to get replaced, uh, maybe in the current capacity in which we trust and rely on those things. Like photography still, I mean, if you really think about it, has already gone through this before in the sense that we all now have great cameras, like thousand dollar cameras in our pockets with phones, with smartphones, yeah. right? There was a time where you had to actually buy a camera for that. There was a time where you actually had to put film and develop that and put it in a room, right? And so there was a time before Photoshop, there was a time for all these things. So I think it's just going to evolve. And at the end of the day, if I want to take a picture of Isabella, yeah, I could describe the scene and I could swap your face on somebody, right? And but it still doesn't create that in the moment thing that that took place, right? In that human element to it. It's the same for graphic design. I do know that, you know, other teams that have graphic designers in house have really leveraged mid journey to just expedite the process, right? Like it still helps them creatively get 80% of the way there. So it's not necessarily replacing their job. I think it's more or less saving them time using it and leveraging it to then you know, basically increase their output, right? Because they don't have to spend so much time in certain elements of the work, right? So if you've got, if you're an agency, for an example, and you're responsible for, you know, doing all these visual elements for your clients across your entire agency, well, this helps you get there faster, right? Mm -hmm. So you still have the need for designers and, and to put those like extra cherries on top and put the finishing touches and drive the direction, but you maybe don't need them spending time like sitting in a room ideating for hours either, right? Like they can test proof of concepts in real time. Wow, well, yeah, that's true. That's really true. This has been absolutely amazing. You're fun, right? <laughs> I I really enjoyed our, our conversation. Um, Drew, where can people find you? Where can they keep learning about Mid Journey? Um, do you have any links or anything? We can yeah, also put it somewhere in the I'll, show notes. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll definitely hand off some links in the show notes. Um, but the best place to find me and, and even just reach out and communicate with me is on LinkedIn. It's definitely one of those places where, you know, maybe if you're listening to this, you're not sure if it's worth reaching out to somebody or asking a question. Uh, you know, my DMs are open. I'm happy to help. This is really a passionate area of mine, you know, just like it is for you, Isabella, with the AI stuff, I think it just speaks to us. And so if we can be as helpful as possible, you know, like that really, it feels good for us too to like share this knowledge and empower other people to start using it. So find me on LinkedIn, uh, check out the show notes. There'll be some other stuff in there. I've created some really helpful uh, guides as well, you know, for beginners and uh, more intermediate players in, in, in mid journey as well. So definitely worth checking out. Awesome. Awesome. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Drew. And thank you everyone for listening. Um, and thanks for, for joining today on the AI marketing show. Thanks everyone.